the first game. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. So welcome everyone to this Netflix seminar. Today we have our special guest, Alessandro Lonardi. He is now a PhD student at Max Planck Institute uh, in Tübingen in uh, Germany. He was also, uh, he does his studies in uh, Padova uh, in Italy. And today, as you can see, he's gonna talk about optimal transport in networks for design and flux optimization. So, so thank you for accepting our invitation, Alessandro, and uh, the floor is yours. Cool. Thank you for the introduction, then. Um, and yeah, I'm going to then start right away. So the my presentation is called Optimal Transport in Networks for Design and Flux Optimization. Uh, but before um, going into that, uh, let me a bit introduce myself. So uh, I'm a PhD student at the Max Plan for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen, a small city in Germany. And I'm also part of the IMPRS IS school. There is the uh, International Max Planck Research School for Intelligence Systems. And my PhD is also part, partly funded by Cyber Valley. There is an ecosystem here in Germany to fund research and development of uh, companies, for example, for scientific research. Uh, all the people that you see on the right are part of my group that is led by Katerina De Bacco on top left. Uh, we are quite a diverse group, and uh, now I'm going to introduce you a bit more on our research. So what we do uh, at the Physics for Inference and Optimization group uh, is that we work on topic of uh, um, related to networks, uh, for example, community detection, network inference, and network routing using tools that come from different fields of science, for example, statistical physics, probability statistics, mathematics, computer science, etc. Um, so the main focus of my research and also the focus of the presentation of today is on uh, network routing, and I'm going to explain you what this means. And uh, the tools that I use are basically all the ones that I listed, so I combine all of them into my research. Um, so, okay, let me give you an example of a classical problem of network routing. Um, Let's imagine you are the owner of a factory that produces ice cream and you, your, your company is located in a certain place uh, within, a, within a city. And what you, want to want, what you want to do is that you want to reach um, a shop where you want to ship your ice cream um, and you want to find the best route in order to do that. And with best, uh, best is quite a complicated concept. But let's say, for example, the cheapest route in terms of uh, price of the roads. Let's imagine all the roads that you need to uh, traverse are, uh, have a certain price toll and you need to minimize the price toll. Then uh, you could choose route A, there is the one that I show in pink, or you could choose route B, there is the one that now I show in pink, or route C, for example, something more complicated. So the question that I'm trying to solve in, uh, in in what I do, uh, so in the research that we, we are developing here is fundamentally trying to give an answer to this problem with all the nuances that I'm going to present in this presentation. Um, so the question again is, which one is the best route? So for now, I use the word best, uh, but best is a word that I don't like or not I don't like, but it's, let's say it's not formal enough. And the content of this slide is to, uh, and of the presentation as well, is to try to formalize the notion of what's best, what's optimal, let's say. So optimal is a better word. And optimal means in, in, in a mathematical, let's say, framework, uh, means minimizing uh, the cost, for example, the cost J, uh, to ship ice cream into, um, into um, to a certain target. So to, to the, let's say you are a retailer again, and you want to ship to a shop, to the shop that here I denote with the flag. So again, in mathematical term, I can, uh, I can, um, 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 I can formalize this, introducing some quantities. And these quantities are G and H. Uh, and these quantities represent the uh, amount of, um, of uh, ice cream that I can uh, deliver and uh, the oh. <laughs> one second guys um, I need to interrupt because my zoom is giving me a problem um, I need to stop sharing the screen probably and then restart sharing uh, can you see my screen 
Yes. Okay, now yes, it's working. Yes. Sorry, sorry. It just, I it's don't know okay. why, but my it's crashed. <laughs> um, so G and H represent, again, the quantity of ice cream that I deliver, and H instead is the need of a shop. So basically, uh, the shops are my customers, and I need to deliver a certain amount of ice cream to each one of the shops. In the, in the example that I proposed, there was one shop, and I needed to, pro to provide a certain amount of ice cream to this shop. Uh, then in order to formalize this problem, I can introduce a cost that is J. And the cost J would be uh, assuming again that every road is, has a certain toll, will be the price that I need to pay in order to, um, in order to traverse this road, multiplied by the amount of ice cream that I want to deliver. And if, you su if I sum this over all the edges that I traverse, then I'm going to obtain the total cost for the ship. So the formulation is rather intuitive. In order to give a, a, a better formalization of, of, this, of this equation here, uh, I call the price, so the toll W, so it's a cost for every edge. And with F, I denote the flux, the absolute value. So the absolute value of F is the absolute value of the amount of ice cream, meaning the quantity of ice cream that I'm actually shipping. Okay, so this is the main functional that I want to optimize. So I want to find an optimal route again. So I'm gonna act on this functional. And then I'm going to introduce uh, something that may, at first sight, may uh, be slightly complicated, but this is simply a conservation constraint that is saying to us, uh, all the ice cream that it basically enters a certain node, for example, imagine you want to ship for your um, company, needs to leave that node, or vice versa, um, all the ice cream that uh, was shipped from the company uh, needs to enter the shop. So it's simply a conservation law that says all the ice cream that I produce gets delivered to uh, my, my shops from the retailer goes to the shop. Okay, so uh, what I introduce now, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, so it's an easy, let's say, introduction to um, a problem that is called optimal transport problem. And uh, uh, its mathematical formulation is the one that you see there on the left. So I want to minimize a cost. That is the cost of the, what I said of the shipment. And the flux is uh, subject to some conservation constraint. They intuitively are those of the ice cream that gets produced is also the ice cream that gets received by the shop. The quantity W is, has many names in general uh, that now I'm going to introduce you. And just to give you an historical context, the optimal transport problem um, is a very old problem. It was introduced in by Gaspard Monge, who is a French mathematician in the 1700s. But then it was popularized by Leonid Kantorovich, who is actually an economist from Russia in the first 1900. Um, the quantity, again, there on the left has different names based on the context. For example, it's called Wasserstein distance or kantorovich rubin distance metric or Hertzmover distance. This is just to give a context. Uh, maybe because maybe all of us in different fields of network science may encounter these quantities with different names. And I guess it's always useful to uh, know the connection between all these names. Um, now I'm going to talk about a seemingly different problem uh, that uh, stems from physics. Uh, physics. Um, so I don't know how many people here are familiar with physics, but uh, let me just uh, briefly mention a classical problem of, uh, that, that you may encounter as a physicist. So let's say you have a, um, an electrical network and uh, electrical networks, the way they work, they have resistances and currents. So currents are those fluxes that transport electrical charge inside a wire. And a resistance is exactly the resistance that the, wi the wire um, opposes to the transport of charges, so to the current that flows into a wire. And there is this, uh, the most standard equation in, in, in physics, uh, probably in, 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 cir in circuit, is Ohm's law. It's what you see on, there on the right. And it says that the voltage that is equivalent basically to the energy that is transported in a, in a circuit is equal to the resistance of the wire times the current that is transported. And imagine you want to minimize the voltage. So you would want to minimize basically the, the, the energy of an electric circuit. So then you obtain a minimization formulation that is rather similar from the one of before, where the weight would correspond to the resistances and the currents will be the fluxes of ice cream, the example before. So funnily enough, this formulation is used in other fields of science, so a more general actual formulation. So uh, usually what people do, they introduce a regularization parameter that here I call gamma. And this is uh, 
very uh, uh, useful and very handy for simulations of different real phenomena, for example, the simulation of river expansions. And it's it, it's quite interesting how a, such a simple formula actually has a, a, such a vast generalization of real phenomena. And again, I invite you to look at the, at the similarity between the optimal transport problem, the one uh, that I presented before, uh, and the, the, fun the function V, so the voltage in this physics context, that it's exactly the same in, in mathematical terms. So finally, I'm going to introduce you to a third problem uh, that may seem uh, related to the ones before, but then we are going to map all of them together. There is the one of capacitated networks and self-adaptation dynamics. So um, let's start with an example uh, that I think it's, it's the easiest way to introduce this problem. So what you see there in the picture is a, a, a living organism uh, that is called a slime mold. Uh, and a slime mold is basically the substance that in the top left picture you see in yellow. And all the white dots that you see are, are food that the slime mold eats. So the slime mold has an, interest, has an interesting cap capability. So it, it basically adapts uh, its body in order to reach source of food and with a sufficient time evolution time in this case 26 hours so in the top right in the bottom right figure um it's 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 shape basically the body of the slime mold becomes a network uh, and that the slime mold itself uses in order to reach sources of food so this may seem unrelated to the to the model of before but what we do um here at MPI, we uh, so here in our group, we work on a model uh, that is inspired from the biology of the slime mold. So again, imagine that the slime mold, so the yellow blob that you see on the left, wants to, wants to reach some food, and in order to reach some food, it needs to um, to develop its structure into into a space, into a network. The way the slime mold works, a bit more in detail, is that the the sort of uh, outer layer of the slime mold is uh, um, it's acts as a pipe. And the real body of the slime mold is the yellow, uh, bright yellow that you see in the center. So what the slime mold does is that first it develops these pipes and then its body moves inside these pipes. And what the slime mold does is quite remarkable because one may wonder what is the size of the pipe that the slime mold needs in order to reach the food. And the slime mold automatically finds the size of the pipe and then moves its body inside in order to reach the food. And the way you can model this mathematically is that you introduce a capacity variable that is basically the width of the pipe, and you make this dependent on the flux of, of the flux, then in this case would be the amount of body of the slime mold that flows. So in the first example, again, the flux was the amount of ice cream. In the second example was the amount of charge. In this biological example will be the plasmodium um, density or, or mass of the slime mold. And by setting a differential equation where the, uh, where the ratio, where the rate of uh, um, growth of the capacity grows with the flux, that means that the pipe would, would get bigger if the, there, is, there is the need of more flux to pass. And instead, the, the capacity would just shrink in case the slime mold would not, does not need to pass through an edge. And the remarkable part uh, of, this, uh, of this formulation is that one can prove, basically, that the slime mold, uh, by, by solving the, the ordinary differential equation on, on top, uh, the slime mold is able automatically to minimize an, edge, an energy functional that looks like that. And it's basically corresponded to the length that the slime mold needs to uh, traverse in order to reach its food, uh, multiplied by the amount of mass that gets transported. And this is also very cool because a sim similar mechanisms are used again in many areas of science, for example, in modeling of leaves. Um, so now I introduce three formulations, one, two, and three. The first one was the one uh, of shipment of ice cream, and it's related to a mathematical formulation that is called optimal transport problem. Uh, the second one was the physics formulation, so what I call energy minimization. And the third one was um, self-adaptation, so it's the story of the slime model. Uh, what we are, are essentially the same thing from three different points of view and in three different fields of science. Uh, but in terms of mathematical optimization, what gets, uh, what gets optimized is the exact same functional, sub subject to the exact same constraints. So in order to uh, combine them all, uh, what you have on the right is J, so it's the functional, and it was it's of the form. Now I'm going to rewrote it in a bit more general terms. 
you have the uh, you have that the cost of a shipment of a certain resource is equal to the length that you need to traverse multiplied by the flux that you transport on an edge and then i put i add the gamma uh, there is a regularization parameter and it's quite established that this is a connection with the ODE that is similar to the slime mold. This is diff uh, slightly different. There is a C and a beta to the beta uh, to power beta to the minus one. But this is because in order to, when you add the regularization parameter in the cost that you want to minimize, this translates to another exponent, equivalent exponent, dual exponent, if we want in, in the ODE. OK, so uh, this is just to uh, introduce, basically. And now, um, the uh, just to give a uh, a, a bit more um a bit more meaning to uh using the ODE formulation rather than a minimization problem. The advantage is that this the one on the left is computationally very efficient. Now, what is the gap in knowledge uh, that we need to cover? So um this all these things were are pretty well established. Uh what we do here, uh, what, 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 we, what I did in my research for, in my PhD, is uh, uh, I wanted to generalize this model in order to introduce the interaction of multiple commodities sharing a unique transportation network. And what does it mean? This means that in all these uh, models, I talked about shipment of ice cream, shipment of resources, or the body of the slime mold. But what if we have different types of flows inside, inside um, um, a network? Um, for example, we want to transport, uh, instead of a unique flux F, we want to transport a, a, flux, a vector of fluxes. Uh, that are ordered from one to M that represent different substances inside one unique capacity. So the, the capacity does not depend on this inte index I. So just to give you an example to formalize this idea, for example, imagine you have different uh, fluids inside a pipe and the index one to M represent the fluids, but the pipe is one and it's unique. So C hat is the capacity of the one unique pipe that is dependent, independent of the flux you want to, tra you want to transport. Um, so this is one example. The other example, there is the example uh, that I mainly work on in my PhD, is that of urban transportation. And practically, in urban transportation, you have, for example, different uh, commodities, different means of transport, for example, a bike, uh, a car, or a bus. And they contribute equally, or if not equally, they all contribute to traffic congestion. And why is that important? It matters for different reasons. One of the reasons is that having a better understanding of, for example, trans transport network is uh, fundamental in order to understand uh, that these are an issues in terms of, for example, pollution, because transport networks are uh, responsible for 8.7 uh, gigatons of CO2, the equivalent. Um, and just to give uh, like um, a comparison of what this, or like an order of magnitude of what this means, uh, like in order to reach the Paris Climate Agreement in seven years, we should halve this quantity. So it's rather pressing as a problem. Um, so what we do, uh, going back to the model, mathematically, we, we formulated this model here that is called multi-commodity optimal transport. That it's a generalization of the model that I presented before. So J was the cost that we needed to minimize. And here, instead of having a single flux, there is the flux uh, that I present uh, that we had until before. We have a vector of fluxes again, the different the different fluids, for example. And these uh, fluxes are paired by a function that is f small f. And basically, these functions uh, explicit the coupling. For example, imagine you have different fluids, and if you want to um, have, uh, if you want these fluids, if these fluids have different, for example, viscosities, different, different uh, f, so small f would represent the interaction between these fluids. And what we found is that basically, by formal, by generalizing a minimization problem, uh, there is also an equivalent ODE formulation. There is the one on the left. And basically, I worked on uh, in my PhD on studying numerically and theoretically the relation between these two problems and exploring the result they have in, in networks. Now, uh, again, f is the function that, so small f is the function that expressed the coupling between commodities. Um, and um, anyway. So, uh, okay, so the first, uh, in the first, so now just to go a bit more practically in what I actually, in the results that I obtained uh, during these three years of my PhD. Uh, so um, in the first work we studied basically, it was mainly theoretical and we studied what are the exact prop the exact relation between uh, dynamical formulation. So the, the, the slime mold formulation and the minimization problem of the uh, shipment of ice cream. So one rather, uh, 
theoretical and the other one with a practical intuition. Say. Uh, and we we took a, a, a function f um, that is uh, uh, conventional, uh, that is useful in order to establish uh, theoretical guarantees mainly. And uh, we found that basically by using the L2 norm of these different fluxes, uh, there is a there is a strong there are very strong theoretical guarantees in the sense that solving one problem the ODE problem corresponds to solving the minimization problem, and then we study what which kind of implication this has on a network, uh, so on the final network that you obtain. Uh, then we went a bit more practical, and because we wanted to apply this model to uh, transportations. And we uh, chose uh, to pair these fluxes, uh, so that I, for example, what I said before, different fluids with an L1 norm. So this is more practical because imagine you take um, a transportation, um, for example, you have a certain amount of cars that's moving in a direction of a road, and you have a certain uh, another amount of cars moves in the opposite direction. By taking the L1 norm, you are just summing up the cars that move in one direction versus the, together with the cars that move in the other direction. And their uh, the, their flux in opposite direction, opposite versus contribute to basically contributes to traffic congestion. So, what we find uh, is that uh, we actually studied it on metro systems. And first of all, uh, we studied um, how having a model like the one that we formulated, what's the effect of the regularization parameter that I introduced before. Uh, that hasn't been uh, explored in in this multi commodity regulation system, and before I said the regularization parameter, I never gave an actual intuition of having a regularization parameter. Uh, but what it means practically is what you see in pictures. So choosing something that is less than one, ideally, and greater than one has two different effects. So when you choose a, param a regularization parameter in the minimization problem that is less than one, what you, what you tend to do is you tend to distribute more fluxes. And you tend to obtain uh, networks where people move uh, that they are uh, that are more robust and they are less susceptible to traffic uh, congestion. So uh, people tend to take longer routes, uh, but for example, uh, the, 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 the uh, environmental impact of this network will be lower. When you have a beta greater than one, then there are central arteries in transportation networks that correspond to highly traversed edges by, by people that use this network. Uh, and this network, they are, they are more efficient in terms of times, of course, in terms of time that people need or take in order to reach their target destination. But then, for example, they are less robust. So that means that if, uh, if a certain link breaks, then people will have to reroute longer in order to find their um, their destination. Um, what we do, what we did then exactly, it's exactly what I mentioned. So we did a study on the Paris Metro where we uh, targeted uh, basically the central stations of, of, the, of the Metro of Paris. And we saw uh, how people would reroute optimally um, in, in case of, of a breakage of a link. So uh, the, 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 the interesting part of, of this model is that basically you have a very strong predictive power over different any, kind of topology of a network. So that means that if you suppose that a, cent a, a certain, you have a strike in a certain area of a city, then you can find how people will optimally reroute in order to reach their goal or reach their target destination. Uh, and here I'm, I'm, I'm as basically list everything that I mentioned up till now. There is also in the paper in case you want to, uh, you want to give it a read. There is also a comparison in terms of computational efficiency with standard methods for, for routing. Uh, optimization. Okay. Uh, to uh, in order to go towards the end of my talk, uh, then we generalize also our formulation to uh, multi-layer networks, uh, and in particular, what you see here is the bus and tram of the city of Bordeaux. And what's interesting here is uh, um, is that we can basically empirically quantify how much adding a tram they congest a bus. And this is also very important in terms of carbon efficiency because trams may run with, uh, with electricity while buses are mainly fueled not by electricity. And having the congesting one mode of transportation with another could be uh, very, very practical for many cities around the world. Okay. So this is the final slide. Uh, and basically it's a slide or one of the final slides. And it's a, it's a slide that uh, sort of of uh, sums up what I what I presented today. 
Uh, so, um, so the, the problem is kind of it's, it's kind of circular, and it's what I'm trying to depict. And it's it's basically there is a sort of need uh, again. I want to stress of understanding how people move in networks and how urban mobility works these days. And what we did is that we proposed a method. Uh, there is one over uh, a million possible methods, uh, and what I show to you are the uh, good sides of it. Uh, but of course, there is much, much work needed to do in this in this regard. And with our method, we we can find empirical results and and uh, and very uh, robust results in terms of um, what's the effect that uh, having people moving a network has on uh, macro macroscopic quantities, for example, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, and then with this result, the idea is that uh, we want to uh, uh, then go back to the original problem and sort of create a feedback loop where we improve the state of living conditions based on science, and then we keep reiterating this, pro this process, ideally until optimally. Uh, again, um, so I really end by just saying that, uh, as I said, I just show you the good side. But of course, it's science, so there are only partial answers uh, to everything that I presented. And there are a million things to explore. Uh, so for example, uh, how do we generalize our model to having people that move in time? So it's rather realistic to think that the pe people that enter stations enter always with the same rate, but they tend to fluctuate during a day. There are hours of peak where there are a lot of people and hours where there are less, there are less people. And this would be interesting to include in our model. So how does our algorithm compare to others? We tested it numerically, and we saw that uh, with many, with much actually quite extensively, our code. And in terms of this, there, there are there are there's still quite some work to do to obtain full scalability of our methods. How do we generalize to higher order structures? For example, hyper hypergraphs that are very trendy today. And how? And the final, the final question that I find personally very pressing is: uh, we have results that are scientific, uh, but it would be very nice to work on translating it in policies that policymakers can actually use in practice. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Here, there are some links with uh, all the social things, and there is my beautiful group on the left and my collaborators, main collaborators on the right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Incredible. It was very, very interesting, especially all the mapping between all the different uh, systems that actually are, can, can be studied the same. So do we have any questions from the audience? Well, I guess I can ask a question I never asked in all these years. Ale, can you give an intuition about how you map a minimization problem, which is the usual writing routing problem, uh, with the solution of ODE? Because I because I never understood this one. So yes, one is the solution yes. of ODE, and the other one is yes. the minimization problem. Yes, yes, uh, it's it's. I mean the the, I mean the, the it's 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 rather formal. Uh, I'm gonna just mention maybe names that are not everyone is familiar to, but the way you do it is that you, I mean you, you just find the Lyapunov function. That is basically just a functional that by solving an ODE. Uh, you solutions of the ODE will just uh, if when they evolve in time, uh, they they will go down under the slope of this functional. In practice, it means that if you take the total derivative of uh, of this functional uh, with respect to uh, the the parameter, the independent parameter of the E, the ODE, then the derivative will be uh, less less than or equal than zero or less than zero. Best case scenario. Um, and uh, basically, the Lyapunov functional has. Um, so what what we did is that we started from the ODE, then we we uh, we hunted for the Lyapunov functional uh, with the right tools, of course, because of course it doesn't come from the sky, but it's just an extension of the Lyapunov. And then the problem there was uh, looking for the right guarantees uh, that allow this derivative to be to 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 be negative in time. And then, um, and then what you can do is that you can rearrange terms and do some tricks, and you find that this is equivalent to the energy minimization that I presented. So, and there, uh, what what comes in is is sort of a physical intuition, uh, but yeah. Okay, so the stationary point of the Lyapunov function can be shown to minimize the exactly, exactly. Exactly. So basically, you just like compute solve the ODE until uh, you get the asymptotic solutions, and then uh, you can prove formally that uh, that they're minimizers of the of the energy. Yeah. 
I mean, the, the initial guess was just that uh, by computing, by setting the derivatives of the of the cost to zero and computing the asymptotes, you we find the you find the you find the scaling law basically uh, between the capacity and the fluxes, and you find that the scaling law is the same. So <laughs> once you find that, you're like, okay, there must be something that I can find, mm -hmm. and then you hunt for that something. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Actually, I have one in the meantime that you think. Uh, in the slide before, you were talking about hypergraphs. And you, yeah, I know that now everything is trendy. We want to do multi layer hypergraphs, yeah. etc. Uh, but so the question that I ask whenever this thing comes up uh, is like, why in this case do we need for hypergraphs? Because it's trendy, it's nice, but sometimes it's like some too much, like you're complicating yeah. too much just because it's everyone does it. And in yeah. a few years, yeah. maybe no one will do it anymore. So it, either yeah. now or never, but why would you use that? So, the, so <laughs> of course the, the trend was more of a joke than, uh, than anything. Um, no, there are actually um, right, right, um, right reasons. I mean, proper reasons to use it in hypergraphs. I mean, one reason that it's very naive and very stupid is just a uh, first exploratory uh, Let's say um, that there needs to be some explorations, I believe, in the beginning uh, in terms of how would even like optimal transport generalize to higher order structures, uh, because you never know what you're going to find with some explorations that is always nice. Um, in terms of um, one application that is just, I don't know, top of my, tip of my top, it just comes out natural, I think. Um, so uh, optimal transport is also very useful um, to perform community detection. It's related to a notion uh, of um, of Ricci curvature that basically gives you um, it gives you an estimate of of uh, so it, the Ricci curvature is basically related to the it's a it's a geometrical quantity that is related to the the optimal transport cost that I introduced here and what you can find with uh, using the Ricci curvature is that basically you can define um, you can define another ODE so you imagine you have uh, i don't know communities inside the network then you can compute the the distance in terms of um, shipment uh, of i don't know packages between these communities uh, and you can compute an optimal transport cost. You can relate this distance then to a Ricci curvature. And with this, this Ricci curvature is useful in a certain way that I don't want to go because it's very specific. Uh, it's useful to distinguish community. And it's, it's, and for example, and this has been done and it has been done for, for uh, networks and it's actually um, computationally incredibly efficient um, because optimal transport is something that many people, especially in machine learning worked on. And there are like regularized formulations of optimal transport that can be solved really incredibly efficient, incredibly efficient, and can also be embedded in, in for example, deep neural networks or, or, or in general, deep architecture. So many, there is, there is a lot of work on making them more efficient. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and the advantage is that, so the tools are very efficient. Uh, this notion of Rishi Corbator to, to find, to solve community detection has been, uh, done for networks, but not for hyper networks. And there it would be cool to include, for example, social interaction that can work pairwise. And it would be cool mm -hmm. to see what happens. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I, I was trying to think of like an example where you would need an optimal transport problem in a CTO or in any on another system in which yeah. you would need an hypergraph. So, so I was thinking, like for example, some where in a company you need at the same time some shipment from two different places to make something in that company. So you need the the both of them. Bring. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but yeah, I'm I'm not really sure. I mean, of course, it's not easy because it's something that yeah. really it's like uh, I think we are the only. So I'm I'm not, uh, but Diego, another person here in our group, another PhD in our group, probably is the first person that started doing this. Uh -huh. Uh, and what they are trying to think now, I don't want to, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. <laughs> now I think that they're thinking about uh, studying um, uh, uh, relational data, for example, in networks of uh, like, like social network where people send messages. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. if you are in a WhatsApp group or something like that, or in any message platform where you have groups with multiple people, 
than how, for example, uh, information spreads optimally when, when uh, interactions between people are also non-pairwise. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, they're doing that, but I think he told me something similar. <laughs> I may I may say something very wrong here. <laughs> so I know that you have prepared also some uh, other discussion topic uh, yes. about the environmental impact. <laughs> yeah. Maybe what we mm -hmm. can um, also include this in the discussion. Uh, but... Yes. Should I go ahead? Okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, okay. So, yeah, it's it just a very, um, uh, basically, uh, an uh, a prosecution of what I was saying before, and it uh, rather, I mean, it's it's a bit salty the way I'm gonna present it, but don't take it personally. Um, so what I was saying before is that, uh, so the, the the pressing issue of the problem of understanding urban transportation is that uh, there are many many problems. One of them is pollution, uh, with the data that I showed before. Uh, just to give you an example of another data that I discovered this last day, uh, it's also like uh, there every so in the world's road in general there are there is a person die uh, every twenty four seconds. Uh, that means that in eight minutes there are like twenty five people basically dying on the road, and it's not like just to, you know, like it's not to to point the fact that it's just sad, but it's just it's the reality of urban transportation. It's something that kind of we should all acknowledge, I believe. And uh, and just to give just to bring in a bit more numbers, so in order to reach the uh, like Paris Climate Agreement, um, we should improve roads in urban transportation in some way. For example, what you see in the left is the share of kilometers traveled with passengers' cars, and we should reduce it uh, with basically the data, the red data in the thick line are the one up to 2020, uh, and we should basically go towards the the blue uh the blue prediction but what we the the path that we're taking is the red dashed arrow and uh, uh for example rapid transit development uh is what you see in the central plot and it the the number of kilometers that should be that should be built for rapid trans transit development should be multiplied by a six times uh factor and when it comes to high quality bike lane you can see that uh, the situation is even more sad uh, where the projection that we need to reach for the Paris Climate Agreement is the blue one, and uh, the actual state is the the orange uh, the orange arrow. Uh, and okay, just to self advertise also. So that's um, I I and then I'm going to stop with the self advertising of a few slides. But uh, what that's what is actually quite. A, uh, so what what we are trying to do uh, recently here is that we started a project that is called Commute. That I invite all of you to. To explore and if you want i'm also free to answer many questions about it uh, and it's basically the idea of using results from scientific research whether it's other our research or uh, research of other people in urban transportation and translate it into policies for poli for 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 actually policy makers so for people that decide actually the urban planning of, of cities um and uh, yeah so uh so this is uh this is the 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 idea and because it's currently a, a big missing gap and uh, and uh, yeah the people that are collaborating uh, in this project are the ones that you see there on the on the on the right so daniela diego and my advisor katerina uh but stop with the self advertising so i want to i, I mentioned this and i mentioned my uh, my uh, my interest uh, in 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 building something like commute uh, because this came out as a, as a sort of self-reflection and as a result of uh, of an idea uh, that it's uh, what is my it, it falls basically under the umbrella of what what is the science that I'm doing during my PhD good for and I think at some point it's probably something that all of us thought like what am I doing uh, in simple terms and uh, just to be a bit provocative uh, there is this nice writing a uh, nice read that I suggest to everyone. And it's uh, in this in this article to the left. There is there is there are some quotes that I really like um, talking about uh, environmental change, so the, the, the environmental impact uh, of. And it says uh, the text says the problem is um, that talking about environmental impact, that the solution that will work for me, I'm going to rephrase it a bit, will not work for you. So by focusing on environmental limits instead of the social strategies that enable better environmental and social outcomes, we fail to engage the only force that nature can help us. Human aspiration for a better future, uh, force of nature that can help us. Sorry. 
And this is basically, it's very, I think it's very provocative and very debatable as a statement, uh, but it goes, um, but it basically, uh, I think it sums up the idea of, of commute. So translating into practice something that it's very empirical, it's very, uh, and it's not to say we should not follow science, but it should, we should be able to translate science in what's in, in a, a, a policy, a social policy that works for all of us. And then, um, and then there is another quote that I think is very important. There is no better future will be possible if those most able to bear the cost, so those who benefit the most, uh, don't step up to pay for it. And I think this is very important uh, because even though doing a PhD is hard or not, uh, is very hard, very hard, sorry. And every we are like complaining all the time and we say how hard it is and how stressful it is. I think like there are privileged people and this is one of them, and it's me, and it's also you. So you, all of this in this in this in this call, we are all very privileged. And I think privilege in general is something that should be acknowledged and actively understood. And to me, active understanding is something that means I should do something about it. Um, and I know it's not easy, and I don't. With this, I don't want to trigger uh, 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 blame rhetoric. And there is actually a person that inspired this reflection. There is a director here in the institute that I that I am. This is something that I think is very cool. Uh, it was in a panel, like for a movie, <laughs> so a related context. But it says something that everything that we do. Uh, I'm gonna rephrase it. I don't want to uh, give quotes to people that didn't say it. But everything we did, we do like the science uh, that we do is part of our society, whether we want it or not. Like every time we publish a paper, this paper is inserted into a social context and it will be accepted by people and information will be read by people based on the social context we start this paper. And I think this is very important to understand and, and help. And I think acknowledging this helps active understanding because I think one of the key points of my PhD was when I actively understood that everything that I did could have an impact. And I think this is a nice way to think about what you do and, and think about also helping in practice with your research and, and finding your best fit in this landscape of doing something practically. So I just end with, uh, with this. There is a question to all of you. There is, what is your science good for? That means basically, I don't know, give a thought to this and try to give an answer. Am I doing something good? Am I doing something bad? And if I'm doing something bad, uh, how can I make it better? And yes, I think this is rather philosophical, but I think it, it's a nice thing to think about. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's very interesting. It's very, uh, I don't know if anyone has uh, wants to add on this. My no, I was more curious uh, about uh, yeah, also if you, Gabriele, or with NetPlace, mm. uh, have you ever organized some workshop or if you're aware from of some summer school, for example, where uh, the aim is really try to create collaborations between uh, scientists and uh, people in charge of uh, actually developing policies? Because also in conferences, okay, I didn't, I didn't attend too many, but uh, I've never seen something like that. And yeah, I was thinking that maybe we can think about, uh, uh, I don't know, two days workshop where we try to to, to put in practice what, uh, I don't know, so what Alessandro was suggesting. Uh, I don't know, maybe it could be interesting. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, I, I think. Yeah, I, I don't think it has been done. Maybe well, with COVID, there has been more... Yeah. Uh, attention to especially to complex scientists there have been a lot of works and so there has been more connections with the policy makers but apart from that i don't think this is a thing like we just do our science and some engineer probably will read <laughs> our paper and uh, we'll do something about it or maybe not it's it's kind of related That's with uh, with the topic of last week of, of last two weeks uh, about the research questions maybe if we get in touch with this kind of policies um, people uh, maybe we can also like understand better what are the problems out there 
and how can we help in this sense like scientists i don't know if it works in this way but i think for example if some 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 people doing the urban research it's like uh, this topic has been introduced in this talk and maybe some academic will be a uh, uh, like a consultant for the government or for uh, some policy maker so when they yeah. make the policy they will ask their advice i don't know if it's working it works so what happens way. usually at least i have the example of urban transportation because now i i'm quite at the deep dive into it uh what happens is that many academics uh they do academia and then at some point they finish academia and then they start working as research consultants for companies independently but i think there is no structured way as of now or other than workshop or events that are mainly hosted yeah. by companies uh, uh, clearly because there is more money going around uh, but i think on the research side there is uh, i mean i think that's kind of lacking and that's what maybe i was also aiming to, to suggest there is uh, yeah, there is not a structured way. You need to do it by yourself and create your way of doing it, and it's exhausting. But there is no um, aligned way of, of getting in contact with people that could use what we do. Uh, so you just put it there and hope for the best kind of it. That's the current state, I think. At least for what I mentioned, I don't know if people that do different things have a perfect life. <laughs> I think maybe yeah, the academia that's my, have a... my experience too. So yeah, I think maybe the academia have a better connection with the industry rather than the policymaker. Really, I mean, maybe the people in the, in the industry could make profits using something from academia, but um, I don't know if the policymaker are really interested in this type of yeah no, but, okay here maybe there is one clarification that i need to do uh, with the word policymaker i mean a rather generic term that could mean like a governmental policymaker yeah. but it could also be imagine you have a i don't know uh you are a retailer uh, so you are uh, i don't know domino's pizza uh and they have uh, an advantage having uh, like uh -huh. <laughs> so, so there are there are like people that work in research departments also in and ship companies, for example. I guess it I depends want... a lot on what you do, because yeah, I... yeah, I'm giving my example, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um... Like coming from, I did maths, so for the initial years of my PhD, uh, which started to be on something that was applied. Uh, at the beginning, it was like, okay, I just do like a model. It's nice. Just I have a research, but without con thinking of the. Um, of the, like when you do maths, you know, like you just think of abstract things and you don't care for the applications of the or the things that you do. But now things have moved on, and now I see that it's really, really important, especially if you start to apply things as we do. Uh, I have like last week I was in Rome and I was speaking to some uh, a couple of professors there, and um, there are some situations in which they are actually like being consulted sometimes. But I, I see that it's very specific to some to a particular thing that they are have been creating, like for example, the economic complex, you know, then started to be like, like started as something like a res research, very academic, and then they started to sell it kind of as a product. And so you can use it as a policy making, and you can use it mm -hmm. at, at a company level, but it's very specific to that kind of thing, and you but it's very hard to use something like urban optimization because it's not a product, you know? It, it, it takes a long time, I guess. I don't yes, know. Yes, I also think to so. convince I think them. So. The problem is to convince them also. It's not... Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, like all of this was not to say that the road is easy, right? It's just to say that... Uh, like taking the first step i think to build a structure communication could help also i mean of course it's a long shot but imagine having a education structured in a way that people like keep an eye on it uh, because i studied physics uh, and i come out and i know how to solve a million equations but i have no idea what 
like if I eventually move to something more practically that it seems is happening, that I have no idea what to do at some point. Uh, so having a sort of having that in the back of your mind is something nice, I think. Uh, whether that takes in the form of, I mean, and and I see that uh, an immediate an immediate uh, thing could be having people that are doing their PhD. So an immediate um, change could be having people that are doing the PhD, like us, being instructed in what market in the market wants by workshops and conferences, so that when you eventually, if you want to stay in academia and you get a later position, then you you have a formal training in that, and then you can change that as your role in the future. Yeah, we're also having talks by professors who are also consultants in the meanwhile. And very simply also to understand how to connect with the policymaker and which are the steps that uh, as a PhD you should follow. Because right now I don't know what, uh, what I should do. I guess especially for us, but not just for us, but yeah, it would be very useful, I agree. But um, yeah, we need, maybe we, 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 sh we should talk to some of these professors and see <laughs> if we can do something about it. Um, I, I think it could be, yeah, it could be really us. interesting, a <laughs> workshop or, or like something, um, seminars, I don't know, related to, to this topic. Because I think it's, it's important like to try to to also building a network of people interested in in this so other phd's other uh researchers early career researchers because uh, the, the senior ones are already consultants and already in the in the route right but um maybe there are other PhDs or other early career uh, researchers that are interested in, in this stuff that maybe could be interested in in a workshop or in a well, series of seminars about it. Yeah, it would be definitely cool. I mean, I'm open. Yeah. You can contact me at any time in case yeah, maybe yeah. arise. But we, um, we, we yeah, can... I think just like network science in general, it's, it's million years behind compared to other of science when it comes to this and it, it's something that you know acknowledged and actively understood i think, I think like, it's it also be because we are very diverse in the sense we are so many topics so uh, uh no i don't think it's because of that i think it's because we come from statistical physics and we start when we grew like as a new field of research I mean, that's my opinion yeah I yeah think. Uh, we didn't care at all of like, uh, impact or uh, just doing physics just for yourself, just the way you do maths, no? Uh, and then we started to become something applied. And so you have uh, computer scientists, you have ecologists, you have uh, biologists that start now to use this or to collaborate with us. So I guess it's just that the, the, the people that were doing like, theoretical physics and didn't care, now do complex science. And those are the senior professors. Uh, while we as young researchers, we started doing this. So we already have our mindset towards application and our future and such. So it's a kind of different mindset that the generation has, you know. I don't know, that's my understanding of why we are in this situation, why at conferences we don't, we never talk about, we just focus on, the research without needing to any need to the impact of what we do or I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's just a thought. It's, I don't know if you have anything to add. Otherwise we can go to the to, to towards the end of this seminar. So I guess yes, that's it. <laughs> well, let's so let, let's continue discussing about this anyway, and uh, let's keep in touch. Uh, I don't know if uh, people here are trying to go to Complenet in case that's the next conference I'm gonna be at least. Yep. And um, but anyway, um, I don't know if Alessandro can share uh, the slides so that we can check all. Yeah, this. yeah, I can send Great. you my email. We're gonna. No secret. <laughs> no, no, no. 
And we're gonna send these slides. Uh, I'm just gonna maybe cut the last part just for sake of uh, using quotes and putting faces with people that they <laughs> I haven't asked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's okay. We can we can cut that. Yes, no problem. Um. Okay, then. Uh, see you in two weeks, and see you around on Twitter and stuff. And uh, all right. Bye. Is this part is this part filmed also of the of the of the what? um, what's gonna get what's gonna get uploaded on YouTube like the whole talk or also so we can uh, decide now if there is any part that we don't want to go usually we upload the whole thing unless there's some okay like this uh, part we can take it out so just tell me I'm fine with uploading the whole thing personally so okay. just, perfect yeah, just a curiosity thank you okay now all right. Let's keep in touch also for yes. this idea because I think it's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the possibility. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.